Hey class, my name is Patrick Pace. Thank you for tuning into my video blog. I hope you enjoy it as much as I have enjoyed this class and uh, the research thus far. Uh, so my topic is on the history of the Greek immigrant community to Wyoming. That's right, there is a sizable Greek immigrant population here in the cowboy state. The manifest destiny-driven, rugged, individualistic, pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, Wild West, least populated state in the Union, and there's a big Greek population here. I mean, they are still a minority population compared to uh, the majority of the state, but its impact is felt. In fact, in just two days, there is going to be uh, a an annual event, the the Greek Festival here in Cheyenne, Wyoming, uh, which they have been uh, celebrating for the better part of a hundred years. And this is the second most attended uh, event in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and one of the most attended events in the state of Wyoming. Over 10,000 people attend this one event every year. And it is a showcase of the Greek culture, the music, the language, the faith, uh, largely Eastern Orthodox. Um, the, the, the guys said the food, the music, the dancing, everything. It's a showcase of their culture. And they have retained this for well over a hundred years. And that has sparked in me some curiosity. Now I'm not I'm not Greek, I'm an Irishman, but I have grown to love this community and I am I'm very interested in how did they hack that? How did they retain uh, more Greekness than most cultures do at this stage in their in their uh, settlement in the United States, wouldn't they become more assimilated into the broader population? I want to know why they've retained so much. To do that, I have to look at some sociological issues. So I'm looking at transnationalism and particularism and cosmopolitanism as the framework for my research. Now, those things in layman's terms are really how do the Greeks relate to their Greekness and their mother country. Uh, how do they retain their Greekness despite all the things around them? And how do they fit in and assimilate and participate in the broader American culture, the broader Wyoming culture? So that's the framework I'm looking at things. And some of the work I'm actually looking into is sociologically rooted. One of the earliest books was printed in uh, 1911 by a gentleman named Henry Pratt Fairchild. It's called Greek Immigration to the United States. Uh, this book uh, was written by uh, Fairchild, who was the first president of the Population, uh, excuse me, Population Association of America, the PAA. The PAA is very polemical, very nativist, very anti-immigrant, very anti-Catholic, very anti-Orthodox, very much into population control, even having members who were eugenicists and uh, others, in fact, funded. Uh, this was this group was funded. They still exist today. They are funded by uh, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. So this is the group <laughs> that uh, is first attacking the Greek immigrant population all the way back in 1911. And by 1920, uh, the 1920s, you had the KKK operating here in Wyoming as well, pushing Francis Warren, who was a senator, to vote on the Immigration Act of, uh, I believe it was 1924. And, and, the, and that was extraordinarily limiting to the Greek population in immigrating. So these factors uh, may have actually pushed the Greeks to assimilate and blend in more uh, than, uh, than their other trappings uh, provided. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the counterbalance to that is the Greek Orthodox Church, the, the annual festival that's, that's here in Wyoming. These things seem to counterbalance the assimilation by retaining cultural elements as vital to their identity. So I wanna know how these things all work out. How, how did they historically uh, progress? And what, what do we expect for the future even, having looked backward? Um, so I think there is historical significance. Uh, it, I think by understanding the history, uh, the Greek population here can uh, understand itself better. Uh, it's, 
it's a great research base for the uh, for the state. Uh, it helps us also to understand immigrant history as a whole. So there is some great significance here, and, and there's not a lot of work. Uh, put into Wyoming, and it might be because of our small population. We have less than 600,000 people. Even though we're the 10th largest state geographically, we're the least populated and the second least densely populated of all, all the states. So that means that the there's not a lot of material, both secondary or primary. Uh, I'm hoping to uncover a lot more primary than anybody else has in the past, because I'm going to be looking at different research uh, areas that have been neglected. Most research comes out of Cheyenne, which is the, the state capital and the largest city, but I'm going to look at some of the, uh, the, the broader areas, including, um, oh gosh, let's see, including Hartville, Wyoming. Uh, There's a book by uh, Patsy Parkin, and she's a lay historian, but she wrote a history of Hartville, Wyoming, which was a mining town that was heavily settled by the Greeks in the early part of the 20th century. So some local history I'm going to be looking at. Uh, most of the history that pertains to Wyoming is, uh, is regional into the, in, in the Rocky Mountain West, uh, such as Reinventing Free Labor uh, by Gunther Peck. Uh, great stuff among the Greeks here, but all cultures. Uh, not a lot of specific Greek uh, secondary sources. Uh, a lot of chapters and a lot of uh, paragraphs on the Greeks, but not a lot of substance. So I'm going to have to backfill that in, and I'm going to provide probably the most comprehensive study of the Greek population here in Wyoming. Uh, even more so than T.A. Larson, who is Wyoming's number one historian, barely mentions the Greeks at all. So this is where I am. I'm almost out of time here, so God bless you. Pray for me.